Welcome back to this video. We are going to discuss this specific type of sampling here, snowball sampling. Now I'm sure you have heard of snowball game, right? So what happens there? <laughs> Friends throw snowballs at each other, right? It's funny. It's really a fun game to play, right? So usually we play this game with our friends or our family members. So we make snowballs out of snow and throw it at our family members or friends for fun. So in keeping with the concept of this game, the sampling method is also called snowball sampling. Why? So here it goes. Let's look at the steps of snowball sampling. And once we go through the steps, I'm sure you will be able to understand why do we call it snowball sampling. So the first step. First, the researcher makes contact with one or two cases in the population. So the very first step is to go to one person, let's say, and take that person's interview or make them fill out the survey. Now, once we are done taking the survey of that person, here comes the next step. Ask these cases to identify further cases. So once we are done taking the interview or survey from that person, we ask that person for further references. So we ask them whether they know somebody else who will be willing to participate in the survey or the interview. So again, we ask these cases to identify further references or further cases for me. So basically what I'm doing here, if you think of it this way, I am giving that person a snowball and then asking them to throw that snowball to somebody else that person knows. It can be that person's friend, it can be that person's acquaintance or a family member. Anybody that person knows who will be willing to participate in my interview or survey. And that is why it's called a snowball sampling. Now, I guess you understand the reason of such naming, right? Now, let's say that person gives me two further references. So I go to both of them and then take their interview. Now. What's the next step? Here it goes. Ask those new cases to identify further new cases and so on. So once I'm done taking the next two people's interview, I ask them again to identify further cases or to provide me further references. And this process goes on and on and on. For how long? Until the researcher stops when either no new cases are given or the sample size is enough. So I'm happy with the number of responses that I have got. So now, if I give you the definition. In snowball sampling, subjects are selected based on referral from other survey respondents. So I gather reference of further respondents from earlier respondents. Again, once I collect survey or interview from a respondent, then I ask that person for further references for the next interviews or surveys. So yes. If I want to summarize the whole thing, at first, the researcher identifies a person who fits the profile of subjects wanted for the study. So here, the very first case or element or the person is identified by me. All right. Now, once I have identified that person and I have taken my first interview, in the next step, the researcher then asks this person for the names and locations of others who would also fit the profile of subjects wanted or needed for the study. All right, so enough with definitions and explanations. Let me give you a practical example here. And then I guess it will be much clearer to you when it is best to use snowball sampling. Usually, snowball sampling is used where respondents are hard to find. And one of the examples when respondents can be hard to find is usually for sensitive research topics. For example, my research topic is this, horrible experience of sexual harassment victims. So after the Me Too campaign, maybe I want to do a research on this topic. And I guess many of you know what do I mean by Me Too campaign, right? Now, if you don't know, I would request you to go online and check what is a Me Too campaign. So yes. Let's assume that this sensitive topic is my research topic. Now, as this is a sensitive topic, we cannot use volunteer sampling or self-select sampling here because if I publicly announce this topic and invite people, many people might hesitate to respond to my survey. Why? Because again, this is a sensitive topic. The victims might not be willing to respond to my survey. So for this topic, 
snowball sampling is more preferred. Why? This is the reason. Let's take a look at this chart. For example, after much searching, I find out one respondent who is willing to participate in my survey. Now, after taking an interview of that person, as I don't know any further references, so I ask that interviewee that whether that person knows any further victims who might be willing to respond to me and be willing to sit for an interview or fill in a survey. Now, maybe this person or this person knows somebody else in their friend circle who was also a victim of sexual harassment and might be willing to participate in the survey. Now, this person provides me further reference of these two people. Now, I go to both of them and take their interviews on this topic. Now, after that, I also again ask them to provide further references. So, in the same manner, this person gives me further four references and this person gives me three further references. So, and this process goes on and on and on until the sample size is big enough for my study. So, this is how a snowball sampling method works. In summary, we rely on further references provided by the respondents. So yes, we are done with snowball sampling here. In the next video, we are going to discuss the last non-probability sampling method, which is quota sampling.